and you know you got them when they lean in and they start giving you advice. Leon, good chat with you, man. I am really excited about this. I've been watching uh, the YouTube uh, channel. I've listened to the pods. It's kind of surreal being here, I have to say. Uh, dude, really we're going to have some fun. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. I'm excited to dive in. Um, let's start off. What, what's the business? Who do you serve? And how do you serve them? Uh, the business is software that helps connect SMB technology companies with enterprise uh, organizations. Um, we serve mainly telco sector. Yeah. And what's it called? Um, Handshaker. Handshaker. Cool. Um, we are in, in kind of a, a niche B2B space with a high ARPU. So um, uh, all, all that sort of uh, comes with a significant challenge in that uh, sales cycles are a little bit longer. Um, and we also have this kind of marketplace dynamic, which is uh, we have two customers. We have a buyer and a seller. Buyer being large enterprise looking at innovation seller being a tech company trying to get the um, eyes and ears of the big tech company. So. Got it. So the model is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, new startup technology wanting to get in front of more established Fortune 2000 clients, you know, uh, both for distribution, for them to get innovation. So the motivation for the big company is innovation, access to early kind of differentiator, unique value. The um, startup, obviously, getting reference accounts, revenue, that kind of thing, some case studies potentially. Um, do I got that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and what are the big challenges that you have that you want to discuss today? Yeah, so, so there's three. Um, the first is marketplace dynamics in that um, we have this complex buy, buyer and seller, two-sided um, software as a service. And you need inventory on one or the other to actually make the thing fly. Uh, yeah. In other words, inventory meaning customers, one has to be bigger than the other. The, the second is um, forecasting uh, mm -hmm. for purposes of fundraising. Um, uh, you know, I've been doing um, sales forecasting for a number of years, but there's an element of blue sky that, that's involved and I don't want it to be beyond credibility. Yeah. Um, and then the last piece is the pricing element. So um, figuring out what our pricing structure would be. I, I've got an idea, but it's, it's uh, again, it's, it's, it's gut feel uh, more than it is researched. And what stage are you guys at today? So we're just under 3K MRR. Um, we're on track to get to around about 5K in the next couple of months. Uh, our target is to get to 10k by the end of this uh, this year. So. And uh, what is the use case today that people are paying for? Walk me through um, kind of a traditional use case. Uh, so, so the key thing is is eyes and ears on a new product or a new technology. Um, the right eyes and ears in, in the big enterprise. For the enterprise, it's an optic on innovation. It's it's actually getting visibility of all the really cool tech out there without having to go to these big conferences and. Um, and then actually putting that in front of functional leaders, not just an innovation function in a large company. Yeah. So those are the two. But what, what's the offering, like use case in regards to, give me examples of people that are currently paying you for the, the to be in the marketplace and what do the companies pay to get access to those companies? So we have um, uh, quite a wide ranging uh, set of sellers that, that have got technology that helps fix spe uh, specific problems in the telco operators. So they have a piece of technology that will help um, understand customer uh, experience. Um, they've got something quite unique that measures both subjective and objective uh, customer experience type metrics. And they're trying to get that into a big operator that probably has you know, lots of people shouting at them to be seen and heard. And maybe they can't get the right person to, to hear them out. Um, so I understand the seller wanting to get in front of the telco what do you do to enable that transaction? What do they pay today? What does uh, the telco right, okay. pay? So, yeah, so, so so for example, um, they'll uh, pay to to be listed, and they do a short elevator pitch, and that elevator pitch is then visualized in a a, a wall of innovation, essentially video wall, 
and that video wall is categorized by functional area for the buyer. So the buyer gets a uh, almost a crowdsourced view of all this innovation and the functional leadership in a big buyer will have visibility of an area that they're particularly interested in. They'll, they'll use tags, et cetera, uh, keywords. And, and that'll pop up, that'll tell them a little bit about um, uh, the company, the seller that's trying to get their attention. They'll have a little video that says, hey, we are X technology company. We can help you get visibility of both the subjective and objective data for your clients in real time. We've got track record of doing this in these places, or we're a startup, et cetera. And so that 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 human touch, that pitch, is then attached yep. um, uh, with a little bit of, um, I guess, background information about the company, um, and maybe just a one pager. Uh, and that's what the, the buyer, the big company sees. But it goes directly to the right person in the business that's sort of identified an area that they're really keen to look at. Um, in, so I understand the seller pays to be listed you help do you help them with the video and help them yeah, with the creative yeah, 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 okay absolutely yeah. and then the buyers what do they pay right now so they are probably the higher end of the scale in terms of pricing structure um and just a subscription to the existing community um they'll pay for two things one is that visibility of the innovation and the second thing is being able to send a requirement confidentially in a swim lane to our community to say, hey guys, we've got this problem. We can't nail it down. Um, what have you got to offer? And so we'll then provide that sort of uh, little video. And what do they to. pay a month right now for that? So right now they're on, on um, a 25K a year um, sort of startup uh, amount. I, I think that should be higher. Um, but that's kind of the level we're at at the moment. So the buyers pay 25K to get access to this innovation. The yeah. sellers right now, do they pay anything? Yeah, so there's a, there's a scale from, uh, depending on size. So if you're a proper startup before you've had funding or anything, if it's um, early on, uh, it's anything from 3K to 13K, yeah, depending on which sort of level you're yeah. at. There's four levels, essentially. Got it. How did you come up with this idea? Where did the inspiration come from? 20 years of BTE, um, I, I've spent that time um, generally sort of small company trying to sell into build, uh, bigger companies, large telcos. Generally, it's a technology play uh, within the networks or IT functions. And it's, and it's, it's hard, right? It's, I mean, you, you know enterprise sales, it's, it's a grind. Um, my last business I was with for 10 years leading global sales. I, I just spent all my time on a plane and, and I got to 20, end of 2019, I was just, I was on a red eye back from the US. And I just spent four or five weeks on the road and I was like, right, there's gotta be a better way of doing this. There's way too much noise out there. Um, and the main people that you wanna get in touch with in, in the enterprise, you know, it's a, it's, it's a long process of getting their attention. It's a long and an, an expensive process, right? So, um, you know, I, I basically lived and breathed it for 20 years. And I just got to the point where I was like, right, let's do something about this. There's gotta be a better way of doing this. Um, and frankly, a lot of the conversations I've had with the buy side, the telco operators, the big guys, um, they struggle to harness innovation properly, right? So a lot of them will have an innovation function. A lot of them will have, you know, specific people that will try and bring in startups um, into their business, but actually getting that into functional leadership and actually, you know, making that um, innovation come to life in their organization is also a, a huge struggle. So um, I wanted to do something about it. And I had enough proof from my previous business to say, okay, this is definitely an itch that needs scratching. Um, and if you can do something tech wise to make that whole process a lot easier, um, then hopefully, you know, it'll, it'll be a decent market fit. So I just thought, right, do it. Let's go for it. Um, so, I mean, this is, and, and that was the inspiration for Handshaker. The way I look at it is you have two separate customers. So marketplaces are unique because it's like having twins, right? You have literally two separate customers you've got to serve. You have the enterprise customer that's looking for innovation, and then you have the startup that's looking for adoption, right? So I always ask myself, which one is the most important to, to build demand around? And in your case, my gut tells me it's the enterprise, right? If you have, you know, 100, 200, 500, enterprises and you know maybe a dozen in each category you know telco or you know communications or whatever you know um you know water and gas or like different things that are similar like cousins 
that if you build that critical mass, then the startups will happily pay, right? And, and I'm always looking for repeatable patterns to match in the market. So when I look at what you're doing, you know, maybe you're aware of this, but there's a lot of these events companies that will pitch you to sponsor or attend their event. Yeah. They get you at a table and then they essentially wine and dine the executives at this, these Fortune 2000 companies to come to the event, to sit down, to hear the pitch, right? And they, they, they kind of pitch it as like business networking. And I mean, it's typically, you know, five to 10, 15 grand per company yeah, that yeah. pays to go, right? So you know that model, right? So you're trying to disrupt this and I would argue in a better, more eloquent way. So the good news is, is your, your, your value proposition, the price point is high enough to support a sales process, okay? So the way I think about it is if that's my customer, these big companies, then I can ask myself, what's true about this customer? What makes them a perfect fit? In my world, I call it a perfect fit customer. A perfect fit means ready to buy. They have the characteristics, they have the values. Like what makes it that if I approach this company, what's true about that company that would tell me that they would be ready to buy my kind of solution? So if I ask you that question, Leon, how do you answer that? What's true about your potential enterprise company that tells you they would easily spend 15 grand a year to get access to your platform? I, I, would, I would say they've got an innovation team that's scouting. Perfect. So they proactively write, look. Write that down, innovations yeah. team, yeah. right? What else? Um, I would say they have, um, it's a technology business. And so they're going to have a, um, a, a truckload of problems to solve. Um, cool. Technology business, innovation center. What I always think about like three core areas. What are the tools they might already have spent money on that might give you indication? What are the expert they may have hired or know of that tells you that they're innovators mm -hmm. or what are the events or groups or places they go and spend time they would tell you that they would be potentially a good fit. Is there yeah. any, if you look at those three buckets, right? What I, I call it the three Fs, fund, follow, and frequent, where would that fit in there? Okay, okay perfect. And, and frankly, most of them are spending a lot of time at, uh, at the big telco events. Mobile World Congress is, be, is probably the big one. Um, perfect, so, so check this out. Cause I'm all like growth hacking. You hear this term growth hacking often, which is like, you know, people kind of look at it as like marketing or, you know, metrics based marketing is kind of what we used to call it before the growth term uh, came about. But I always look for um, distribution or like, um, you know, taking a wide net and really getting more spheres focus. Um, actually great book. If you haven't read it, Predictable Revenue by Aaron Ross, he talks about spheres, nets, uh, in there. But when I hear what you're sharing, I'm hearing they go to this event, which you just mentioned, right? What was the event again? Mobile World Congress. Right. So they go to mobile, mobile Con Congress, mobile world Congress. Sorry. I'm not okay. <laughs> so they go to mobile world Congress of those people. So that's the original hit list in there. You say, okay, of those companies, which ones have innovation departments. So everybody that doesn't, you take them out. And then maybe within there, I'm looking for something else, right? Maybe I'm looking for that they have adopted this technology, right? Mm -hmm. In the consumer space or in the B2B space, you say they have a Snapchat account, right? If you're a business and you have a Snapchat account, you're an early adopter, right? Because mm -hmm. what we're trying to find is the early adopters in your market. Because if you do a really good job at aggregating hundreds of businesses that look like this, but they're not early adopters, then the technology companies won't have liquidity. They won't sell through. They won't get adopted. You won't build case studies to be able to share to other people in the market that your platform works, right? So that's what we're looking for. What, what, what would tell you if they're an early adopter versus a lagger, you know, and, and Michael Moore's kind of innovation adoption curve? Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny, telco should be an early adopter of a lot of things, but, but, um, they kind of fuck the trend. Um, I would suggest if they are uh, running their own cloud or yeah. uh, vocally supporting a particular cloud technology or uh, provider, then it gives you a really yep. good indication. They are adopting. That, that's the one. And then cloud. So here's what's cool. 
and I, I meant Jeffrey Moore, not Michael Moore. I think Michael Moore is the uh, the the movie director. <laughs> Jeffrey Moore is the innovator yeah, um, yeah. and genius. So, for example, I was working with one of my uh, portfolio companies that I invested in, and they were they were building a payroll software in Manila, and they were having a hard time getting in front of their early adopters, right? So same exercise went through, what are the three Fs, fun, follow, frequent. And one of the things they came to was, well, most of these SMBs use Google apps for domain. This is before it was called Google Suite, right? But Google apps for domain. Yeah, yeah. Now, Leon, if you're technical enough to know that, and I ask you, okay, if I got a list of a hundred companies, how would I know if they use Google apps for domain? If you know, you would say, oh, well, you could check the DNS records to see if their mail record is set to Google mm -hmm. mail server. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, so, yeah. So, so, and there's this great uh, site called Built With that can, that can potentially provide you with that information. So Built With, I think will tell you the cloud provider they're using, the technology stack, the MarTech stack, the email tools. So you can almost use Built With to give them a grading score of early adopters. So if you take people that attend uh, the mobile world, you know, expo, um, people that have a uh, cloud and an innovation team, all of a sudden now you're, you're, you're making sales to, you're using a sphere to go after those accounts to get them, which is going to queue you up to build the demand side of your marketplace so that there's liquidity on yeah. the startup side. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, so I really thought so that, that would be the first thing. Um, you had a few other questions about pricing and what was the other one? So maybe the, the forecasting for fundraising. So I don't know, um, maybe the forecasting comes next, but yeah, so, so the first thing is enterprise uh, pricing. So figuring out um, a pricing structure without it being, um, uh, you know, maybe, uh, I guess, uh, well, uh, it's a kind of a rule of a thumb type approach rather than it being. Yeah. Uh, I mean, here's, here's the truth. In, in, in most startups, pricing is not something you should optimize for. I think you need to capture value. You need to be able to support your growth. You need to be able to, to cover your costs. But in the early days, your first 10 accounts might get your service at cost, right? Or even you might be even more generous with your time and say, look, we're not trying to make you know, 85% gross margin. We're just trying to learn and experiment and, and, we're, and we're just gonna price it aggressively in the market to get those first customers. If we're successful, we're gonna get the case study. We're gonna get the testimonial. We're gonna get some, you know, we really need them to bootstrap the marketplace anyway. So don't worry too much about pricing. I think what you should, what you should look at is, is there similar type products that companies that size pay for, right? It could be consulting retainers, could be innovation retainers, it could be whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And if they have them, then you could easily use that as a, a kind of a benchmark, right? And say, look, companies are already used to spending X amount of money on innovation, consulting, et cetera, right? Maybe they pay for an account for Deloitte, not Deloitte, but um, maybe they pay for an account for, um, you know, uh, Gartner, right? So the, the, because they're giving them innovation and like research and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And you could kind of look at that price point and say, you know, if they're paying for that, then they would pay for this. Cause we actually are more a tangible implementation version of that. And, and then using that to kind of build out your forecast and your sales process. But at the end of the day, you need to build demand generation. Maybe it's through these events, buying those lists, filtering them through your qualifiers that make them a perfect fit customer and then building some kind of knowledge around you know is this a 60 90 day 160 day sales cycle right um big companies typically are longer the reason why is because teams need to go through budget approval right when you're a big company you can't just decide to spend 25 grand like yeah, yeah. it's very few people in the org that's allowed to do that so then there's some pricing strategies there, like trying to keep it below a certain amount per month, right? And that gets into the discretionary budgets for a team potentially, right? But I would say if you pattern match against something they're already used to paying for, then, then people will be like, okay, yeah, you're right. They do pay, you know, 15 grand a year for this or 25 grand. You were only pricing at 15. Our products differentiated because of these things. Um, this is the size of the market. Here's our go-to-market strategy be specific, you know, this is the way we're going to do it. And as we build that up, 
you know, we're going to partner with these accelerators to build the, the supply side, right? Which is the, the, the technology companies, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The demand is, if you can get people to buy what the supply has to offer, then there'll be more supply than you can deal with, right? At the end of the day, if I'm a taxi and you have, you got fares for me, even if I'm not a taxi, I'll become a taxi if there's business to be made. Does that make sense? Yes, the yes, you need to build some level of supply to have liquidity so that people looking for that demand don't come up and have a blank slate experience. But you do that slowly using the bowling pin strategy, meaning that you start with one industry like you've done, you make sure you get a certain amount of coverage, and then you ask yourself, what's the close cousin? I call it the close cousin. Jeffrey Moore probably has a better term for it, but it's the second and the third bowling pin, right? What looks the same, right? So if I'm going, if I'm selling to telco, maybe water and gas is similar, but you also said that they have an innovation stack. So maybe not, right? So you'll have to understand what looks the same because those are the markets you wanna go after second and third to build the, the supply or the demand side or supply side to match that, right? Because you always wanna make sure that there's liquidity. Yeah, to totally get it. And um, I think, you know, you, you mentioned the pattern matching um phrase which i think is probably a better way of saying the rule of thumb type approach than that, that i mentioned um mm -hmm. essentially i've done i've looked at the type of subscriptions these guys are paying for the type of um events they're going to and i've gone okay if they're paying 25 30 40k for those types of events then they should be able to pay for this type of product um i, I was I, and, and that methodology if i stand in front of a a potential investor and then give them that sort of pattern matching approach they're not going to say well you know you haven't put no match. it's it's literally what i call napkin math right where you you've mapped out a very logical informed argument for why your pricing is in the realm of possibility yeah, right okay. and you've already kind of proved it out a little bit it's not optimized you're not trying to optimize right now you're trying to build liquidity and build scale but over time you know that you can kind of increase the prices to be able to improve your go-to-market and your monetization. That's a really good way to present it. In regards to like what's mm -hmm. aggressive versus not, I mean, if you're raising venture capital and you wanna build a venture-backed business, you need to show some kind of way that you're gonna to get to 100 million in revenue in the next seven years. That's the rule of thumb, right? Because investors are making a, t a dozen bets on somebody being a winner. And if that's you, they wanna hear how are you going to stack that growth and build out that team and leverage their capital to to build the the marketplace, right? And what does that liquidity look like at scale? Yeah. Does that help? It does really help. Um, so, so Leon, as we wrap up, what are the big takeaways for you? What 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 resonated the most with you from our conversation? For me, it's it's uh, pattern matching. Um, I, you know, I think that's a really great way to describe how to show that you've got uh, a methodology, essentially a rough guide um how to hone in on your right um your right buyer um you know the three key areas we talked about um and finally you know uh, i think the, the the biggest thing is is the the close cousins i think as well is also a really good uh, thing that i took from the from the session um if you can show you you've got some form of methodology to focus on one market and you've got close relatives you can go after them it shows you've got a growth uh, potential so yeah yeah and you just want to show the 10 pins these are the first three these are the ones we've already planned out each one is worth x amount of market share or size of revenue or potential and that's how we get to 100 million and it just feels thoughtful and logical and that's what investors want and then and then, then and you know you got them when they lean in and they start giving you advice just so yeah. you know the moment they you stop talking and they go but you could also do this that's when you know you've got an investor on the hook. Awesome. Awesome. Leon, it's been a pleasure, man. Great to meet you. Great to meet you. All Thank right. you. Have an amazing rest of the day. We'll talk soon. Take care. And you.